Hey guys, uh, welcome back to Bex Connects. Um, today's video is going to be a, quite a bit shorter, uh, hopefully once once all is said and done, than my first two. And um, the reason for that is because I am still recovering from an extra little bug that came in, in addition to all my chronic illnesses. And um, I don't mention that every video to complain. I mention it just to explain why, after just a minute, I'm going to have to put my sunglasses on again. Um, my lighting situation still isn't great, obviously, as you can tell on the video, but um, my migraine and trigeminal pain on that right side, and especially my right eye, are really bothering me today. So um, I will be putting my sunglasses on in a minute. But first, I wanted to I wanted to start a series, and hopefully it will be a regular series. I don't know if it will be every Monday or if it will be every other Monday, or just on whatever Mondays I'm able to do it. But the series is called Monday Modifiers. If you're curious about what that means, I want to read you um, a definition, actually, from a grammar website, because I'm, I'm nuts about grammar and words and wordplay, and my brain fog with these illnesses has taken that away from me, but I do have a piece of paper up on my wall over on the other wall that says I have a degree in English, so we're going to go with that and know that I love words and I love grammar. So, what is a modifier? Modifiers are words, phrases, or clauses that provide description in sentences. Modifiers allow writers to take the picture they have in their heads and transfer it accurately to their readers. Essentially, modifiers breathe life into sentences, and that's that's a sentence from that explanation that I just love. Modifiers breathe life into sentences because the modifiers that we're going to be discussing on Modifier Mondays are um, modifiers that we need for life. Um, it goes on to say, you know, modifiers can be adjective, adjectives, adjectives, ah, uh, I'm sorry, I love grammar and I couldn't even say the parts of speech. Let's try this again. Modifiers can be adjectives, adjective clauses, adverbs, adverb clauses, absolute phrases, infinitive phrases, participle phrases, and prepositional phrases. Now, I'm not going to get into all of that right now because we could talk about grammar for hours and hours and still not cover all of those things. But um, I, wanna, I want you to think about the part where it says modifiers breathe life into sentences because that kind of forms the foundation for what we are going to be talking about. Um, today's topic, and if you, look, if you catch me looking down, it's because I'm looking at my notes here. I know they're, <laughs> they're very messy. I flashed that quickly on purpose because uh, my handwriting is embarrassing. It always has been. But um, today's Modifier Monday uh, topic, like I said, if you see me looking down, it's because i got to look at my notes to remind myself. And I'm actually, you know what, I'm not going to put my glasses on. It's going to be a short video, so I'll push through it. Um, today's Modifier Monday, uh, we're going to be talking about, let me find it here. Oh, yeah. Um, before we start, I actually want to say that one of the formats that I may do Modifier Monday, um, it's the format I'm doing today. I'll decide later or not whether I'm going to stick with it or whether I'm just going to go with whatever comes in my mind. But today we're going through the five vowels, A-E-I-O-U, and we're not doing Y because I didn't want to have to go with sometimes Y, even though I like even numbers better than odd numbers. Um, we're going to go with the five main vowels, you know, excluding Y. A-E-I-O-U, and we're going to be talking about five vowels that are necessary to make it through chronic illness, or to make it through when you are caring for someone with a chronic illness, or in the greater scheme of things, to make it through life. So, number one, the first vowel that is required if you want to make it through chronic illness slash caring for someone with a chronic illness, hold on, let me, let me get my beagle to stop moving the bed. Stop. Sorry about that in the middle of the video. She stays on the bed and she scratches nonstop no matter how much uh, we do to treat her her itchiness and allergies and everything. I feel sorry for her, but she got to know to stop when mommy's recording a video. Anyway, okay, so back to the list. Sorry about that uh, aside there. I'll get better at editing those out as time goes on. I just want to get this video done to where it's less than a million minutes long for y'all watching. So number one on our list of five vowels to making it through chronic illness slash caring for someone with a chronic illness slash life in general, um, the first vowel, number one, A, is adaptability or being adaptable. 
adapt is our word here. Now, adapt itself um, is a verb. You know, it's not necessarily a modifier, but if you are adaptable, that, and it becomes an adjective, so that modifies, you know, your characteristics as a person. I historically am not adaptable. I never have been um, in my... <sighs> Everyone says that they don't like change. If you'd looked at my life for the 27 years that led up till I'm, I'm 28 right now, but if you led up at the first 27 years of my life up until just a few months ago, uh, which my birthday was just last month, it was less than a month ago, but just until like July or August of this year, um, I would resist change with every cell and fiber in my being. Um, I thought all change was bad, even good change, because it was different, and I didn't like that. I like staying just like I was, status quo. Um, now, I have I had a higher bar status quo set for myself than I did for anyone else, but I was not adaptable. If anything changed, I froze, and I freaked out, and I just shut down, and my anxiety kicked in, and my heart starts, you know, going like that, and I can't breathe, and I can't talk, and I'm just uh, not adaptable. I never was, never have been. Um, however. Over the past almost four years, I've really had to learn to become adaptable. And I, I'd say four years that time. It's not really until the past several months that I've gotten better at practicing it daily. But over the past four years, that's a quality that both I and my husband and the rest of my family that lives here in town, my parents and my sister and brother live here in town, um, and my, my, grand, my grandmother, my last uh, living grandparent. And we've had to get really adaptable. Um... You know, I could make plans to even go out into the living room, which I you see me film from bed a lot because it physically is more draining on me to even sit or lie on the couch than it is to sit or lie right here in the bedroom. I, I can't explain that other than my anxiety um, that accompanies these diseases. The, the, the anxiety that I already had um, is exacerbated a lot by chronic Lyme and all of the co-infections, as are all of the psychiatric um, issues and neuropsychiatric conditions. Um, but, uh, I, it's just, it's draining on me. I can't plan anything in advance. And if I do happen to be able to make it to an event, I have to be adaptable to whatever comes my way. Um, if I'm out at a band concert, for instance, go visit my second video. If you want to see how, what it all took to, what all it took to get to that band concert. Um, and I'm talking about a high school band, not like a, you know, famous band mosh pit concert. Um, but it was still cool. It was still a victory that I got to go. Um, you have to learn what you need to have in any situation to be able to get through the situation. And I'm not talking about the anxiety part of it, although that is part of it. Um, you have to, you know, whatever situation comes up, you need to know what you can do to address it then and there so you don't get into that uh, freak out mode. Um, and that kind of goes along with not letting yourself feel guilty if you've made a commitment to someone and you have to break it because, um, you know, you, you, you can't feel guilty over a health condition or something that you can't control. And with these illnesses, I oftentimes can't control what my body can do on any given day. So, um, you just have to be adaptable and we'll just go ahead and tack on a number one A. Uh, which is ironic because we're doing the vowel A for this number one, but we're just going to say you got to accept it too. You got to accept that it's okay to be adaptable and to take whatever steps you need to do in any given situation to meet the needs that you have um, and to, to not, you know, to not let yourself just get completely stuck in this cycle of, you know, I, I'm never going to be able to to do this or this or this because I've got this. And it's like, no, you know what? I can do this to this extent. But I have to let myself adapt and realize that, you know, I can accept that this is not necessarily my normal forever, but it's my normal for right now. And it's not the same normal, you know, I say normal in, in a loose sense. I mean, you know, status quo for your own personal life, whatever that may be. It's not the normal I used to have, but it's the normal I've got right now. It's the normal I'm working with right now, so I can fix that. Sorry, that was the beagle again, if you saw that shaking and heard the noise. Okay, number two. Empathy, being empathetic. Um, empathy, again, is uh, a noun itself, I guess. Uh, but I don't know why I said I guess. It is a noun. Uh, but being empathetic would be the adjective firm of form. Form. Adjective form, not adjective firm. Adjective form of empathy. 
And once again, this applies not only to the person struggling, but to those caring for the person struggling. Um, those that are the caregivers or those that are friends and family really need to learn true empathy and learn what it means to show true empathy. And that doesn't mean that you understand what someone is going through if you haven't gone through it. And it doesn't mean that you should tell them that you understand it. Uh, because oftentimes you really have no idea. However, if it's a person, you know, like my husband has has, a, has as good of an idea as anyone can that doesn't deal with it directly themselves, um, and he is very empathetic in that, however I'm feeling, he is able to tune into that and ask me what I need or if I need help or if I just need to be left alone. Um, and he's very good at picking up on my... Um, emotional cues and the signals that I'm sending out, maybe without even realizing to. And he's he's very, very much able to um, adapt, go back to number one, adapt to whatever situation so he can exercise that empathy and show me, you know, whatever, whatever um, love or consideration or empathy that I need to be shown that specific day. Um, but conversely, just because I'm the sick one doesn't mean I get out of showing empathy. And in some ways, people that struggle with chronic illnesses, actually, in many ways, I've, I've discovered through all of the people that I've met and connected with through these processes. Um, we are, and I'm not saying this to brag on myself, I'm saying we just as an umbrella for the chronic illness community. I never say that every single person in this certain group feels this exact way. So I just want to make that clear. But many, many individuals with chronic illnesses, most if not all that I know personally, are some of the most empathetic people I have ever met. Um, you know, we, we, um, it's hard to explain, but essentially when you're in a place where you know you need to be on the receiving end, you need others to be empathetic if when you're on the receiving end, um, when your life is stripped from you and you're left with this list of diagnoses that keeps piling up and treatments that you have to do and you're bedridden and you can't resume your normal life that you used to have, what used to be your normal, uh, yet at least, um, you realize just how important empathy is. And that's empathy towards others that you may have met through your process that are going through a similar thing. You're just saying, listen, I get it. Um. I'm here for you in whatever way I'm able to be, whether that's a text message, whether that's literally just letting someone vent to you or letting them cry or rejoicing in their happiness, even if you're not quite as happy as they are. Um, even if you've had a setback or are not in a ne necessarily a great place emotionally one day and one of your friends or loved ones that's going through something, um, you know, like, like say my husband, he has his middle school band concert tonight and I'm actually not able to attend that one. But he does such a great job with that band and his family's coming in from a few hours away they live uh about two hours 45 minutes northeast of here and his uh parents and sister are coming in to see it and i know for a fact that he is going to be so thrilled and hey i'm thrilled to see him i i haven't gotten to see that family for almost a year now last christmas when they came down here because i'm not able to travel up there right now and it's 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 great that we're going to see him and i know for a fact that he's going to be so happy so no matter how I feel tonight, whether I'm able to visit or not, which crossing my fingers and I'm praying, I'm hoping I'm able to visit at least for a little while with, with that side of the family. Um, you know, if I happen to be in the middle of a big pain flare or symptom flare, I'm not going to, as soon as he walks in the door, start hitting him with that and say, listen, to me, this is horrible. This is horrible. Blah, 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 blah. No, I'm not saying you can't share how you feel or you can't share that you're struggling with your spouse, but... If they are your primary caregiver or whomever is your primary caregiver or anyone that knows what you're going through and they are excited about something, say he has a really great concert, which I know it will be because he's a great band director um, and his kids, I mean, they do a great job for as well as middle schoolers can. Um, I'm going to be happy for him and I'm going to make sure he knows that even if that means putting aside my own pain. It doesn't mean my pain's not there. It just means that I'm choosing to be empathetic and enjoy his joy with him, whether I feel the joy or not. Now, what's cool about that is when you allow yourself to feel joy for someone else, even if you don't feel it yourself at, at first, you're going to end up feeling joy, which is a topic for another video as well. But I just wanted to add that in there quickly. Number three, or if we want to go with Germany, I think they count 
one, two, three, don't they? Anyway, number three, number three. I hope none of those were any gang symbols. I didn't mean anything like that. Just here's our third item. Um, being introspective. I, the vowel I. So we went through A and E and I. We're going with introspection. Introspection, the vowel. Introspective is the ad, uh, adjective. Introspective, that is. I may have said that. I literally can't keep my train of thought from one sentence to the next. That's why I've got to have my notes here at least to remind me of my bullet points. Um, before you can be of any good to anyone else or of any good to yourself, you have to be able to look inside yourself um, and see what life is trying to tell you. See what your body's trying to tell you. See what your relationships are trying to tell you. See what your soul is trying to tell you. And if you are talking, 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 and it feels like chaos, chaos, chaos all the time around you, go somewhere quiet, sit down, shut up, and listen, and let God talk to you. If you let him talk to you, he'll talk, but you're not going to hear him if you're constantly talking and trying to do this and trying to do that for yourself, for others, for insert reason or activity here. He's, you know, you're not going to be able to go inside and listen and see what you're supposed to be learning or doing in any, in any or with any circumstance that you face. Um, and I mean, you, you have to be able to just pause and allow yourself to be, and it's not meditation. It can be med meditating. Meditation is one thing that helps us channel that introspective being that we all have, whether we know it or not. But when I say we need to be introspective, um, again, that's for both someone suffering, someone who's not, someone who may be caring for someone who's suffering, or just people in life in general. In order to change things, period, you have to be introspective and examining your own life and examining, you know, if, if you see that something is not feeling right or not working out the way you want it to, you got to look deep inside and you got to be willing to listen and just shut up. We're a society that likes to talk. You got to shut up and you got to listen and see what your heart, see what your soul is trying to tell you and what it's trying to teach you about, uh, here are my brackets. I can't really do the squares, but insert situation X here. Um, introspective, uh, being introspective is something that is absolutely invaluable and absolutely necessary to get through life. Being able to tune into your own emotions and feelings and, um, it's just, and examining, you know, what, what you're going to need to do and taking your time to do whatever that is. Give me a second. I got to stop the beagle again. Sorry about that. Got up close to that light there too. I got my eye. Sorry again. Um, okay. Number four, uh, optimism or the adjective form being optimistic. I am in no way saying that you have to be 100% bubbly positive. Everything is good and butterflies and flowers all the time because guess what? It's not. Not even for people who have a happy life. Not even for people who you see on social media that have the perfect life. Life is not all sunshine and rainbows and butterflies all the time. It's just not. But that doesn't mean you can't be optimistic. Optimism doesn't mean that you always think that the best is always happening 100% of the time. Mm -mm. It means that you are open to the possibility that whatever situation is coming up, even if it's a bad situation, even if you find yourself in a bad circumstance, whatever it is, you are optimistic that that can change and you can choose to be happy in that moment. And we talked, I talked about that in a couple videos and I think I've touched on that in both of my other videos so far, but, um, you know, it's not just thinking yourself well or thinking yourself to happiness. It is the daily practice of choosing to see things through a lens that is not doom and gloom and woe is me. And it's very easy to do that when you have a chronic illness or multiple chronic illnesses, when you're a caregiver for someone that does, when you just have someone in your family that's fighting that. I know my parents can get into this too, as well as can I, and so does my husband at times. You know, it's easy to fall into the trap of thinking, oh, this sucks, this is horrible, nothing's ever going to go right, treatment's never going to be finished, we're never going to be, you know, you're never going to be well like you were before. I know I think that to myself sometimes, and I'm working on it daily, having to remind myself, you know what, what's the opposite? And, and, and let me say this, an easy way to identify if you're being pessimistic or optimistic and how that's going to work in your life. Make a list and write down the first 10 thoughts that come to mind about your day. Like right now, pause the video if you need to, get out a notebook and write down a list of 10 
thoughts that come to mind. So I'll give you a second if you need to pause it. Okay, if you paused it, you saw me sitting there like that. If you didn't, you saw me sitting there like that for a couple seconds, probably looking silly. But um, on that list of things, if you read through them and you feel this kind of just sense of dread or heaviness or negativity while you read them, or if they are just outright negative statements, then that's a good, good thing that can kind of tip you off to showing that you're not really practicing the mindset of optimism. And when I say the mindset of optimism, again, I just mean being open to the possibility that the best can come from any situation, whatever the best is in any particular situation. I don't know what it is in every situation, but I'm learning to be open to the possibility. And this is coming from someone who used to be an extreme pessimist. I always saw the glass, you know, if it was that full, it was always closer to empty than it was full, even if it was exactly half. I mean, I, this is something that as I'm telling it to you, I'm also working on it daily and have been for the past several months because there's no other way that I could make it at this point if I didn't make that a daily practice, trying to choose to focus on the positives and find the positives even in, even in the negatives. So living in an optimistic mindset does not mean that you can never complain. It doesn't mean that you don't have troubles. It doesn't mean that you're pain-free. It doesn't mean that all of your struggles in every area of life are gone. It just means that you're choosing to see the good in any and every possible way that you can and that you expect that a good outcome can happen from any and every circumstance. So there's optimism. That was number four. Number five, the last one, which this went longer than I wanted it to again, but number five, understanding. And that's both a noun and an adjective. So thank goodness I don't have to explain that any more than that. But when you are understanding, it doesn't necessarily mean that you know every single fact about someone else's illness or condition or whatever. It also doesn't mean that you understand their emotions that they're dealing with. Um, and this is another one that goes both ways. My husband cannot understand physically how I feel. He can't understand emotionally how I feel because he's not the one dealing with this, these illnesses. At the same time, I can't understand how he feels as a 33-year-old caregiver to his 28-year-old wife who has had to fill that role for four years, and he has completely lost... Well, I don't want to say completely, but he has lost many different areas of life that used to be normal for him because they were normal things we do together. And he can't or doesn't do them anymore because he is either taking care of me or, you know, he's at work. Or when we are able to do things together, stuff inside the house, like watching a movie in the bedroom or a ball game or working on a jigsaw puzzle if it's a really good day. Um... But despite all that, he is so understanding, even though he knows he can't understand every physical symptom, every emotional whirlwind and tailspin that my mind goes through. He knows he can't understand all of those as they are to me, but he understands that it is, that it is very real to me. So he is very understanding and shows that by just being here. And being here for whatever, um, you know, if there's something I need, he's here to help me in any way that he can. If if I just need to, to, to be with someone but I don't want to talk, he'll sit right here beside me. He'll hold my hand. He'll let me lay, you know, my head in his lap if I want, if I just need to lay down. And I just want to be with someone but I but I can't, uh, you know, really talk. He, he is there. He is the most understanding individual I can... <laughs> When I get in the middle of my rage episodes, here's an example for you. Rage episodes that include throwing things around the bedroom, breaking things, wanting to break things, wanting to punch the wall, slamming doors, slamming drawers, slamming everything else that rhymes with drawers and doors. Um, I don't know what else that would be, but that was an unintentional rhyme in the first place. Um, his reaction to that now that he knows what it is, when he, when he sees it, he can recognize that that's a rage episode triggered by illness. He just says, okay, I'm staying out. I'll wait till it passes. And that may sound cold to people who don't understand it, but that is the absolute best thing he can do in those instances because if he tried to do anything else, I would bite his head off with my words. And I'm not proud of it, but that's what these episodes do. And he knows that. And I know that. So it's a really great gift to both of us because I don't have to feel guilty for saying things like that to him, even if they're out of my control physiologically with the triggers in my brain. Um, and he 
you know, doesn't have to endure my rage. He's able to go into the other room and just do whatever until it passes, which it eventually does. Um, every time it always eventually passes. It just sometimes takes longer than others. Um, but you know, he's become very, very understanding in so many ways that I couldn't even explain in one video. Um, on the flip side, I also have to be understanding and that's something I still have to work on. Um, to be quite honest with you, and I have to be understanding in different ways, but it's still understanding. I have to be understanding that as soon as he comes home from work, it's not okay to just immediately say, oh my gosh, here's how horrible my day was. This happened, this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened, this symptom, this symptom, this symptom, this flare up, this flare up, this flare up, treatment, treatment, can't do this, can't do this, pain, ache, blah, 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 everything. Again, I say blah, 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 not to minimize my pain. Not to minimize the pain of anyone, okay? I'm not minimizing it, but I'm not going to bombard him with every single thing of that as soon as he comes in the door after working an entire day, um, you know, because I understand he needs his decompression time, much like I do multiple times a day. <laughs> he needs his own decompression time. So I understand and have learned to approach things um, differently as far as when he's coming home from work or if he, if I can tell he's in a really great mood, like I said again, and I'm just having a really bad day, I try to be understanding and I try to show the, the um, excitement for him even if he can tell that I'm in pain because even if your person, whoever your person is, whether it's a spouse, whether it's, you know, any, any partner, boyfriend, girlfriend, um, whether it's your parents, whether it's your siblings, whoever it is, whoever your person is, um, even if they see that you're having a hard time or see that you're in pain, if they are excited or if they need their decompression alone time and they, uh, you know, they can't write that second. Now, obviously, if this is an emergency, if I had an emergency when he got home and we had to go to the ER, obviously I'd say it, but whoever your person is, if they just need that time or they need they need someone to acknowledge their excitement and to show excitement for them or with them, even if you can't truly do it with them yourselves in your heart, if you're having a hard day emotionally, physically, spiritually, however, um, in whichever way, you can still try your hardest to show your excitement for them or at least speak it to them or just just give them a smile or if you're able to a hug now there are days i can't hug people because of my neuropathy and it literally hurts my bones and my nerves and my skin sometimes to to be hugged or touched at all but um you know i understand that to him me making an effort to show that i'm excited for him because i know he's excited means more to him than if, you know, I, I waited until a day when I felt great and then tried to go back in time and say, oh, hey, you remember this day? I was really happy for you that day. Sorry I couldn't tell you because I was going through this and this and this, these horrible health things and I felt like this and the pain was there and I was depressed and I was anxiety ridden and, you know, it doesn't have quite the same effect. And if they, whoever your person is that you see more often than not, if you're struggling with a chronic illness of any kind, um, physical or mental, if they see you making an effort to try to be understanding of them, I can tell you firsthand because my husband has told it to me, that means the world to them. And they know, they don't assume that, now Now, some people may, I can't, again, can't make a blanket statement, but I can say this at least in the case of my husband. I know for a fact, if I do that, he's not going to assume that I had a great day. He's going to assume, oh, well, I can tell she's not feeling great, but man, how not, you know, she she was excited for me. That makes me feel really good. And I'll just tell you right now, if you try to push through the pain how in, in any way that you can, you know, I'm not saying push yourself to the point where it's detrimental, but if you're able to push through the pain in any way and just to share that excitement and that, that form of understanding um, what your what your caregiver or your spouse or whomever it is needs, um, and they see you doing that, they are much more likely to do a better job of it themselves. So it's kind of this, you know, cycle of just life and marriage and love. And that's how love works. You're there for the other person in sickness and in health. And if anyone has proven that statement and has lived out that example, um, it's my husband in sickness and in health. Um, so again, to review the five vowels for um, 
the five vows required when going through a chronic illness, caring for someone with a chronic illness, or in a broader sense, life in general. A, um, being adaptable and accepting that it's okay to change and be adaptable, and it's okay that you're not able to do everything that you used to be able to do. Um, two is E, be empathetic. I mean, you may not know exactly what someone's going through, but if you can tell that they're having a hard time, you can empathize with that because chances are you've had hard times at some point in your life. Number three is I, be introspective because before you can be any good to yourself or to anybody else, you have to know what's going on inside and what you can do for yourself or what you need to do for yourself. Maybe things you need to change. You have to just shut up and listen to what your heart is telling you, what your soul is saying, what your body's telling you, and you have to be introspective before you can be any good to yourself or the world or anyone else. Number four, O, optimism. You gotta be optimistic. You cannot make it through life without being optimistic. And five years ago, I would have wanted to just slap someone who said that sentence because it sounds like something that someone would say if they're just saying, well, if you're optimistic, everything's going to be better. Nope, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that when you're optimistic, the crappy things are a lot more easily endured. It doesn't mean they're easy. I said more easily. They could still be really hard. But if you approach them with optimism and, you know, just this sense of optimistic curiosity of, well, what can I take from this that is positive? What can this teach me? What good can come from this? Life is easier. Not easy, necessarily, because life's not easy by definition. I don't know. I'll have to look that up in a video and make it make a video, I guess, on the definition of life. But um, optimism sure makes it a lot easier whatever the level of difficulty is. It can always be easier when you choose to see the positives in whatever situation. And number five, we talked about understanding. Uh, mind, body, soul, spirit, the full being. Um, if you are the person struggling, you still need to be understanding toward, towards those who are caring for you and towards your loved ones and your friends and family, uh, as well as they need to be understanding towards you. Whether, and and We've already established they don't know exactly what you're going through physically, emotionally. However, they don't know. They can't understand it perfectly. But you can help them understand by letting them know what you need. And that way, they, even if they can't understand exactly what's going on, they can understand, okay, she's going through a really hard time right now. She or he, you know, what I'm not, I was just said she because I was talking about myself. You know, she's going through a really hard time right now. She's told me before that this and this and this are things that are helpful, this and this and this, you know, those are things that don't help. I understand kind of this particular situation we're facing today and what I can do in this situation to take care of myself, but also help her. That way we are both on, you know, the absolute best trajectory we can be in this moment. Um... So once again, we went through AEIOU, and yet once again, it's been an extremely long video, but I, I really, I promise I'm going to be making them shorter. Now that we've got Monday modifiers, um, I'm hoping these videos are going to be under 10 minutes. Uh, if, you know, that's that's my goal for the Monday modify Monday. Good night. Am I showing my Kentucky accent, right? Um, Monday modifiers. Uh, hopefully those, these videos are going to end up being 10 minutes, underneath 10 minutes long, but I wanted to do some extra explanation today just to kind of give you background on what the Monday modifiers are going to be. So if you have suggestions for topics for Monday modifiers, such as, um, you know, and let's, let's just say if we're going with the vowel format and you don't have to give me the vowels, but say, you know, five vowels to succeed at, um, writing a story. But I, that was random. I know I'm a, I'm, like I said, I'm an English person. So that was the first example that came to mind. But, you know, five, five vowels um, to work through your panic attack, five vowels to deal with annoying people, five vowels to stay happy, five vowels to stay in the optimistic state of mind, five vowels to help with relaxation. Five, you, you, you get it. And it doesn't have to be vowels. Um, it could be any form of modifier. So if you have a topic that you would like me to see extrapolate um, into different modifiers, maybe I will make them always with the vowels, but you don't have to say that. 
um, just give me a topic you want to hear about. Uh, no matter, and it doesn't have to be health related. It can be anything. It can be music related. It can be, um, it can be uh, related to Christianity or the Bible or church. It can be related to sports or Kentucky basketball. I'm always up for talking about. It can be related to Disney movies. It can be related to. EMFs, electromagnetic fields, and the dangers they can do. Um, it can be related to literally anything that I feel is a safe topic to post. And by safe, I mean I'm not going to be cursing. I'm not going to be talking about, you know, um, things that would receive anything higher than a PG-13 rating of the movies. Um, so if you have any suggestions, please type them down in the comments below. And I will be looking for them. And I really hope to be able to connect with you more. Um, thanks again for coming back to Bex Connects, and we'll be getting to shorter videos, I promise you. It's just going to take me a little while, um, because like I said, it's hard for me to think straight. Maybe I'll start typing out my full, um, for a few videos, maybe I'll type out a full transcript and practice and see, you know, if I can get better at condensing my time. Um, but that's all I've got for you today. Uh, that was my word on the five vowels at making it through chronic illness and through life from any any perspective, uh, any any point of view, I should say. And uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, mon these Monday modifiers. I almost said modifier Monday. Maybe I'll start saying that. Yeah, maybe it's going to be modifier Monday. Modifiers Monday. Modifier Monday. Mo Monday modifiers. In any case, hope you've enjoyed it. Hope that you've taken something from it and can't wait to connect with you again. Catch you on the flip side.